This is Normandy. Famous for the D-Day landings, the events that took place here still leave us awestruck. It's become a place of pilgrimage, a center for commemoration, a magnet for movie makers, and to historians like me. I'm James Holland. My work on the Second World War has taken me to Normandy many times before. But on this trip, I'm hoping to gain a new perspective. This is Dr. Mike Simpson, a decorated US veteran, ex-Special Ops and an Army Ranger, whose unit is legendary in the D-Day story. You've never been to Normandy, but, but this is in kind of sort of America's DNA, particularly yeah. if you're an ex-serviceman like yourself. The hairs on my arms are standing a little bit. It's my privilege to be Mike's guide on his first trip to the battlefield. Right. That's it, looks almost exactly the same. And in return, I hope he can give me new insight using the benefit of his military experience. When I see this tactically, this is a kill box. You know, every little window here, that can be a machine gun. Every little window can be a sniper. So here we are, one historian, one seasoned military veteran, and a journey of over a thousand miles to better understand one of history's great chapters. Beyond the beaches, beyond D-Day, and into the heart of the battle to retake France. This is my home in Wiltshire and the start point for our journey. I believe the narrative of D-Day in Normandy has undersold the story, and I'm looking forward to sharing with Mike my thoughts on the Allies' approach. I call it Big War, a strategy that combined enormous global reach and technology to ensure steel, not flesh, did much of the hard yards. Well, Mike, I'm so excited about you being here. You come all the way over, and finally, you're going to get to Normandy, which is, I have to say, an incredibly beautiful place. I can't wait to see it. I've seen all the Hollywood depictions. I've walked probably every museum exhibit you possibly can. I've seen the documentaries, but I've never stood on the ground. Right. In fact, I'm, the hairs on my arms are standing a little bit, <laughs> standing up a little bit thinking about it. And that's the point. To properly understand how a campaign like Normandy played out, there's no substitute for seeing it yourself. You have to go there. Now, we're not going to be able to cover every little bit of ground, but we are going to be looking at quite a lot of detail and you are going to get a very clear overall impression of how this campaign began, the middle, the end, how it was fought. And I promise you, your mind will be completely changed about D-Day. War is fought on three levels, so the strategic is obviously the overview, you know, the ultimate aims. This is the kind of high-end stuff. This is your generals and your presidents and prime ministers and right. so on. Then you've got the tactical, which is the coal face of war. So this is your guy in his foxhole in the bocage, the actual fighting bit. And then you've got the operational level. And that's the bit that's been left out of the narrative. And that's what links the strategic to the tactical. It's the nuts and bolts. It's the economics of war. It's factories. It's Hershey bars. It's, it's yeah. cups of tea for the, our, our Tommies. Because it doesn't matter how good your plan is. It doesn't matter how brave and how physically fit your troops are. If you can't keep them paid, keep them fed, keep them supplied on right. the move, you're not going to win anything. No, exactly. Yeah. This is the big piece that never gets talked about. Absolutely. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a couple of days here in, in the UK, okay. um, touring around. I'm going to show you some camps. Um, and then we're going to go over across the channel overnight, just like the boys did on D-Day. And, uh, and then we're going to tour around. Can't wait. The Allies had really begun to hone the concept of big war by the eve of D-Day. It was something the Germans never achieved in anything like the same scale. Nowhere illustrates this disparity better than the Battle of Normandy. The gargantuan scale and complexity of D-Day and the campaign that unfurled is barely imaginable today. We've become too focused on the men leaping from the landing craft and not looking exactly how they came to be there and what was supporting them. It's the worst weather in this car because you get all the spray from the road comes up. We're heading southwest into Dorset and to where many of the Americans who would be landing on D-Day were training in the months and years beforehand. 
plan for camps just over there, and, and this is where um, the 29th Infantry were. Okay. So all this was huge, great camps here. Yeah. This would have been all rifle ranges, maneuvers back and forth. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so they they did exercises down on the coastline and you know down on the beaches and stuff. But this is where they were camped. Yeah. As a U.S. Army Ranger, this is where Mike's Normandy campaign would have started back in 1944. These troops were destined for Omaha Beach and Point de Hoc. So, Mike, we're going to see Steve George, and he's a guy I've known for a little while. He got in touch with me because I was doing some work down here, but I didn't really know anything about Royal Men. I mean, I know the first division was here, but I don't know much about him. He is the expert. And he's okay. also got an amazing museum in Coswell. Before D-Day, this corner of Dorset was home not only to the Rangers, but the entire US 1st Infantry Division, known as the Big Red One. Not bad to see you again. Yeah, thanks for coming out. I really That's appreciate okay. it. This is Mike Simpson. Hey, how are you, Mike? Very nice to meet He's you. He's a friend of mine. He's uh, ex-Rangers, ex-US Special Forces. I, mean, I was just saying to Mike, I, I know a bit about Broadmine. I know the 1st Infantry Division were here, but I don't know much about it. Tiny small village in Dorset, um, mm. end of the summer, or late summer, 43. All the Americans all of a sudden just turn up and basically take over the place. So, yeah, 1st Infantry Division, 18th Infantry Regiment, they're here. Mm -hmm. Rangers, they're also here. Second and fifth? Second. Second Rangers are here. Yeah. Okay. And then some of the guys um, from 116th Infantry Regiment, 29th Infantry Division. But you can see this one, this is the first one you'll see. Oh, it's look. weathered. But there you go. Oh, look, there it is. Big red one. So is that a big red one? Yeah. Private John, and I can't read this bit. Have you worked it out yet, Steve? No. Because <laughs> what you want to know is what happened to these guys? Did they right. make it? Depending on the time of day and the sunshine and everything like that, it does look a lot different, if you know what I mean. Somebody, isn't it amazing? Yeah. It's just that tactile link, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, all those years ago. There were over a million US troops in England at this time, some of whom had been training for more than two years. Incredibly, more Allied soldiers died training for D-Day than were killed on the 6th of June. Others were victims of the Luftwaffe. The village was hit a couple of times. Really? Yeah. So, um, in fact, yeah, there's loss of life. You know, the Americans, you know, we had two KIA um, confirmed and um, at least 18 wounded. It sounds a bit soppy, but, you know, they were living, loving and dying, you know, within our yeah. communities. Yeah. And people don't realise that. And they just think, oh, it's all about what happened over there. Yeah. But it started here. Yeah. No, it's yeah, so yeah. strange to think of an American... We've been American, talking about that already, haven't we? Yeah, an American World War II KIA killed on UK soil. That, uh, that's yeah. not something we talk about back home. That's... Yeah. Didn't know no, that. No, that's amazing. In May 1944, the Americans here were spread out across several camps. Two men at Camp A were Tom and D. Bowles of the 18th Infantry Regiment of the 1st Infantry Division. So these guys are people I met years and years and years ago, and they were identical twins, and they both landed in the same company on Easy Red. Really? On D-Day. And we took them down here because they had this photo that they'd taken back in the war outside this pub. Hello. Hi there, hi there, hi there. Fine, thank you. So what can have? I don't remember the fire plate being there. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is all here. Cheers, Mike. Cheers. To the balls twin. Yeah, yeah, indeed. That window oh, look yeah, familiar? Yeah, it's that window right there. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Come here and look at then look at this one. There's the door. There's the door. So it's changed. They've got to put a porch on it. Yeah. And it's absolutely one of the same place, yeah, isn't it? it? sure is. I know we had some guys worried about getting home to their wives and everything, but we didn't have anything to worry about. The 18th Infantry was our home. 
The Bulbas twins weren't new to combat. They've been through multiple campaigns. And that picture you showed me where they're, you know, they're, with, they're here having a beer with their mates. And they're looking at each other and they know mm. some of these guys aren't going to make it. So when you're, when you're just about to go on deployment, you know, mm -hmm. you're about to go on operations. Mm -hmm. I mean, wh what do you think the, these guys would be feeling as they're, as they're getting ready to go across the channel? I, I kind of lump them into three different groups. In one group, I would lump the Bulls twins, right? So these are the battle-hardened veterans. They've seen it before. They've, they've seen the elephant, as we say. They've been there. They've done that. On the other end, on the, on the far end of the spectrum, I put uh, the fresh troops who've had uh, basic training back home, and they've come over as replacements. Okay, most of them are on the younger end of the spectrum. They're probably very nervous about this. They're looking to the, those mentors. And then the third group, is where I put the guys from Easy Company, right? The guys from Band of Brothers. Because although they've had extensive training and they've been together as a cohort for a real long period of time. They've not been tested, have they? They haven't been tested at all. There's but are, like, you feeling, are you feeling kind of excited? Are you feeling scared? Are you feeling yeah. apprehensive? Do, you, do yeah. you sort of get those little moments sort of thinking, gosh, I wonder if this is the last time I'll have this or the last time I'll do this because? Yeah, I mean, I, I've written the death letter before. Have you? You know, and, and giving it, giving it to somebody, and handing them my dog tags in one hand, and saying these are for my youngest son, and uh, the ball cap I used to wear in the other hand, and saying this is for my oldest son, mm. and he said I won't get him messed up, and giving him my death letter and saying this is for my wife. But you, it is a leap into the unknown, isn't it? It's a leap into the unknown, not not as much for the weaponry, equipment, and training as it is for yourself, because mm. you don't know when the first shot is fired in anger, what am I going to do? Right. Am I going to do what I'm supposed to do? Am I going to run to the sound of gunfire? Am I going to freeze? You don't know that until it happens. But I do have to say, I mean, the, the first time that I knew that I was going to get shot at on purpose um, was a little bit different than all the other times thereafter. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. One comfort for the young Allied troops readying for battle was the huge material wealth that would support them. What the Allies have worked out by 1944 is their way of war. They're going to use steel, not flesh, as far as they possibly can. So they're going to use industrialization, mechanization, to do a lot of the hard yards so that a generation of young men doesn't have to do it. The Allied support tower was immense not just in terms of firepower, but also repair workshops, the best medical support, and plentiful food. No wonder nearly 50% of Allied soldiers were service troops. Yes, we've got this vast array of supplies over here in southern England, and millions of men, but you can only take so much across the channel on D-Day itself. Right. So it's the battle of the builder. The challenge for the Allies was to get these supplies across the channel in enough strength before the Germans achieved their own build-up in Normandy. Castletown in Portland was just one of the many ports in southern England preparing for D-Day. So Mike, I've got loads of photos here and there's nothing I like more than a good then and now. And look at this, okay? So look at that. Oh, that, that, was, that was literally taken from right where we're standing. On the 4th of June, 5th of June, this place was absolutely teeming. I can visualize these landing craft here. I can visualize those trucks and men milling around here as they are in, in this, this place. I mean, here they are. You know, this is here. Yeah. Right against that, that wall is where these guys are. They're coming down right down here. The logistics of it are just staggering. You know, you're talking about over 4,100 vessels. Right. It's like total invasion rate, something like 7,000 craft. You know, all along the ports, all along the southern coast. You've got to get the right people in the right place at the right time onto the right vessel. I mean, it's a heck of a process. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there is, there is so much that can go wrong at any one moment. But that's what enables you 
to actually do the, um, the, the, the invasion. The challenge wasn't just in getting the material across the channel. There was also the problem of unloading at the other end with no available port. The solution was outrageous, but brilliant. See that? Yeah. That big block of concrete? Mm -hmm. That is a Phoenix caisson. And actually, that was part of the Mulberry Harbour. Really? There were two built. They used 332,000 cubic yards of concrete and 32,000 tonnes of steel. They're two floating harbours the size of Dover. And then it was just pushed with a tug? Is that how it made it across? Pushed with a tug, yeah. Wow. It's an unbelievably ambitious project. Come up with a guy called um, Lieutenant Commander John Hughes Hallett. What always amazes me about the Mulberry Harbours is just the fact that someone had the audacity to even think about them in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know what we'll do. We'll create this huge kind of floating box of concrete and we'll build them and they'll be the size of Dover. And then we'll get some tugs and we'll float them across the channel and then we'll plant them and then we'll have a harbour. And it'll be just like that. Isn't that a great idea? And everyone sort of starts scratching their heads and going, actually, no, that's not a really good idea. That's just how on earth are we ever going to construct right. that? You know, we are in the middle of a war, by the way, guys. You know, we've got other things to think about. And Churchill, who's always one for kind of jumping onto anything that's kind of new and innovative, says, oh, don't argue the matter. That'll just sort itself out. Just get on with it and make it. And they do. We're now heading to Tarrant Rushton Airfield. Allied Air Forces were vital to plans for Overlord. For two months, they had been bombing bridges, railways, and communication systems in France and Northwest Europe, and very successfully, too. From this base, it was gliders that would be taking off. D Day would see the largest force of airborne troops ever to be used. I kind of see that the, the way they use the gliders as like the predecessor to how we use helicopters, is we need to put people right here. Yep. You know, right at this spot. Because if they have any reaction time at all, that's gonna ruin everything. We gotta deliver the entire aircraft load right away, form up and move. There is none of this hitting an assembly point and then going. It's boom, you gotta do it all at once. Right. And that's how all my, my ops have been. The gliders were to be used to capture very specific and vital targets as swiftly and clinically as possible. The only way you're going to stop them from blowing up the bridges was by coming in by glider. Then you could jump out, take them by, by surprise, mm -hmm. capture the bridge before they set off the demolitions. That's the idea. But most people think it's going to be really, really, really difficult and a, and a big ask. From here, six gliders, each with 28 men, were given the task of taking two bridges, codenamed Horsa and Pegasus, that ran across the River Orne and the Conn Canal. But imagine what it's like. I mean, there was a guy called Dennis Edwards who was still a teenager. He thinks it's going to be a suicide mission. You know, he barely sleeps a wink the night before. They're given a last pint of beer. <laughs> uh, you know, and then it's time to load up. My muscles tightened. A cold shiver ran up my spine. I went hot and cold and sang all the louder to stop my teeth chattering. I did over 250 jumps in my career. Really? That's a lot. And I remember almost every single one in detail. That's amazing. But the thing about a jump in training is you have all this adrenaline going up to it. You know, your mouth gets dry. You, you feel the knot in your stomach. Uh, you, you're excited. All your senses are completely heightened. But you know you get down to the ground, you land safely, and then there's this feeling where you relax because it's over now. My, the big life threat has passed. But for these guys, their day was just starting. And uh, it reminds me of something an old Sergeant Major said. He said, uh, airborne is a great title. That's not who we are. That's just how we get to work. It's important to remember the Allies were fighting on three fronts, in the air, on land, and at sea. Our next destination is Portsmouth, the epicenter of D-Day planning and where the mind-bogglingly complex naval plan was prepared. It's where the Allied senior commanders, drawn from all three services, had based themselves. And by and large, you find that the Allies are getting on really well with one another. There are exceptions, there are flare-ups, there are disagreements, of course. 
But for the most part, they work incredibly well. And the level of cooperation and coordination is absolutely extraordinary. When you compare that with the Germans and how they treat one another and how they treated their allies throughout the war, it's just in a different league. And actually, that all comes from the top. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was the supreme Allied commander. He pressed the importance of unity of endeavor at every turn. It was vital. I've been in the Joint Operational Center and seen Navy SEAL commanders and, and Tier 1 Army commanders argue vehemently over a point. Because if you have a Tier 1 Special Operations Unit uh, performing a mission and another unit in support, another unit providing the transportation, they're all going to have a little bit of a disagreement about how their assets should be utilized within the battle space. And they're always going to have those discussions and they're always going to be passionate about it. Right. Uh, everybody wants to be heard because at the end of the day, everybody wants to walk out of that planning meeting knowing that they were the best advocate possible for their own troops and the best advocate possible for how they see the completion of the mission. And then ultimately, even after all that, you're going to recognize the chain of command and you're going to do what you're told. The plan was devised by a combined services multinational planning team and approved at every step of the way by the Allied leadership. The architect, though, was General Bernard Montgomery, the overall Allied land commander for D-Day. Monty is a controversial figure and one that has garnered increasing criticism in recent years. I believe a lot of this is unjustified and that it's time to reappraise his war effort. What you have to understand is that Monty is a really cussed, difficult character. He's, he's, you know, people have said said actually he was on the spectrum or he was actually autistic. He, he has this total inability to read what other people are thinking. And that constantly gets him into trouble, but that doesn't make him a bad general. The basic idea is that he land here, at Utah Beach here, and then at five along here, and this is where Band would have been. This is the, uh, the, the River Orne and the Con Canal. So they're going to come in here, land here. Now, the most important thing, airborne forces are going to come in at the bottom of the Cotentin Peninsula here, secure this, protect this landing here, and ditto here. And this is the really key bit for the British. Secure this bridge here over the River Orne there, mm -hmm. and then knock out all the bridges here and get this high ground. And that stops 15th Army, because the French coastline goes up that way. Right. And it starts 15th Army coming here and attacking from the flanks. That means that bit's secure, that bit's secure, and they can push forward. And I think, all things considered, with the limitations on shipping, this is about as good a plan as you can possibly have. Bad weather delayed the invasion by 24 hours. But a bigger concern was ensuring clear channels for the invasion fleet a job entrusted to 255 minesweepers. The Allied Air Forces dropped 197,000 tonnes of bombs on strategic targets in the nine weeks before D-Day. This effort was crucial to the plan of subduing the German response. Once landed, the cat would be out of the bag and the race would be on. Who would build up a decisive number of troops and weapons first, the Allies or the Germans? Well, you can see the first hint of dawn over there, Mike. And we're actually going to hit the beach right about the time they were hitting the beach. So everybody's awake at this point, whether they could sleep during the night or not, and you're hearing these shells go overhead. Yeah. So it's, it's becoming very real to you at this point. Everyone on those boats is feeling apprehensive, scared, freezing cold, soaked to the skin. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's before you even got to the beach. Right. Well, this is the point as a soldier that your mind is going through that mental checklist again and again and again. You're rechecking your battle rifle, you're rechecking your equipment, you're checking your mates to your left and right, and you're thinking about everything you're going to have to do when you hit the beach. This is the point that they're going through their part of the plan again and again and again and again. But that's a good thing because it, in a way it kind of keeps you from being so scared that you're going to freeze up. And that's also how you ensure success because they've rehearsed it so much at this point that it's become this mental check off that they're going to tick off as soon as the ramp goes down. But as D-Day dawned, 
much hinged on the next few hours and whether the airborne forces had achieved their aims and the landing troops would manage to secure a foothold. No one was certain how strongly the Germans would defend, how efficiently they would reinforce the bridgehead, or how quickly they would react. Oops! <laughs> I forgot what side of the road I was on. <laughs> it was inevitable. It was inevitable at some point. Yeah. We've come ashore and are heading inland to see where the British airborne forces were dropped. The Gliderborne troops from Tarrant Rushton landed on the 6th of June at our first stop, Pegasus Bridge. If you undershoot, even by 100 yards or so, now you have to fight across that same open ground, that same open ground that was perfect to land on. You now have to fight across. And then if the overshoot, same scenario, only it's even worse. Because now certainly everybody on both sides of the bridge and in the village has seen you. And yep. now you're fighting your way back. The men of D Company, the Ox and Bucks, landed at Pegasus and Horsa Bridges at around 16 minutes past midnight. What they're doing is they're coming over here like this, circling round and then coming down. It's exactly as they think it's going to be. You know, they studied the photograph so well, they studied the map so well. And what you've got is this gun position here. This is Pegasus Bridge. Relief. Exhilaration, incredulity. I experienced all these feelings upon realizing that we had taken the bridge. And this is where he comes to a halt. What was the activity like on the ground? Were they taking fire as they were coming in? Absolutely not at all. No, None? No. None. They, 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 they come down here. The front of the, of the glider just nudges the wire around here. They jump out chucking grenades in at, at these gun positions, storm across the bridge, and they've got it. And they discover that the charges hadn't even been put on the bridge. The whole reason that they had to get in and seize the bridge quickly was so they wouldn't have time to hit that detonator. And, and it was never in place anyway. So it, it was never really in place anyway. So the plan went perfectly, but as it turns out, they, they actually probably could have kind of strolled in down the road, and they would have had time to do it. Yeah, they capture the cafe on the other side there. There's a little railway line that runs up and down. Uh, and they capture that, and the guy digs up his champagne from kind of, you know, which he's buried since the start of the occupation, right. gets it out, everyone has a glass, and everyone's sort of going, well, this is great and everything, but actually we've got kind of a battle to fight. I'm also keen to take Mike to Romville Church, just a mile east of Pegasus Bridge. So, Mike, the first airborne troops to land are the Ox and Bucks down at Pegasus Bridge, right. but the first paratroopers to land are the 22nd Independent Parachute Company, and they are the Pathfinders. So these are the guys with the Eureka Beacons and all the rest of it on the right. ground, setting up the drop zones. Anyway, one of the guys is Sergeant Herb Fussell, and he's with his mate, and his mate is desperate for a number two. And there's, a, there's an outside privy here at the church. So his mate goes in there, and Herb is sitting here, smoking a cigarette, standing here, suddenly, a frightened German bursts through the gates, runs up towards him with his MP40, his Schmeissy and his submachine gun, and goes like that. And there's the bullet holes. So Herb's completely unharmed. Yeah, he's just yeah. standing there and he doesn't move an inch yeah. and, and the bullets have just gone wide. Right. So he then shoots the German dead. The guy comes out of the, having had his number two, right. going, what on earth's happened here? Right. And he said, we just got attacked by a German. <laughs> This church holds the graves of many of those British airborne troops killed in the first hours of D-Day. But you can see they bury a lot of the paras around the edge here. Mm -hmm. One grave in particular holds a special significance. OK, so this is Lieutenant Den Braveridge. Mm -hmm. And you can see here? the first British soldier to fall on the 6th of June. Huh. It's an amazing place to see all these graves around the, the churchyard like this, and to know that most of them were killed in the kind of, you know, opening hours of D-Day. Yeah, it really brings it home. <laughs> Should we go? 
paratroopers also had a critical job to do. Their main task was to destroy five key bridges over the River Dive, several miles east of Ronville. The paratrooper drop was far more scattered than those of the Gliderborne troops. So the guy who's in charge of the engineers that have got to destroy these bridges is a guy called Major Tim Rosevere. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he lands at drop zone N when he's supposed to land at drop zone K because the pathfinders for drop zone K get mistakenly dropped here in N. Okay, so the beacon was, was there, it just wasn't where it was supposed to be, so the pilots right. dropped there. So the pilots dropped them here. So instead of going, landing here, and they've actually then got to get an extra kind of three miles. So they managed to come across a jeep full of medical supplies. And they go, hang on a minute, we're going to have this. Our needs are greater right now. So I'm commandeering this jeep. And they've got these two little trolleys full of 500 pounds worth of, of, of explosives. They transfer it into the kind of the, the jeep, which has got a little trailer on it. They set up a guy with a Bren gun in the back of the trailer and they go, right, let's go for it. Hurtling down. There's the deep valley, all flooded, all that area. The trailer swaying around like mad. They're presumably swerving as well to kind of also to sure. kind of make themselves a harder target. They managed to drive through Truan and kept going towards the bridge. Reaching it, they placed the charges and successfully blew it up. Mission accomplished. Well, isn't it amazing seeing this? I had no idea this was here. And of course, the new bridge, because they blew it up. Right. <laughs> this is, strategically and operationally, this is just a huge objective. You look at it, you say, wow, what a small bridge. But pivotally, so important to the battlefield. Yeah, but also, look how deep it is. I mean, you're not going to get across that in a no, 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 no. But it's amazing. So I've got his, the rest of his after action report. So on our arrival at the bridge, which was not held, we found Sapper Peachy and his Bren were missing. So obviously, as they've careered down this hill, lurching violently from one side to another, poor old Peachy has fallen out of the trailer. And actually, what happens to him is he gets captured. Well, I mean, they had no choice, because no he even choice. says their primary objective was here. Yes. And every moment that they wasted there, they could reinforce that Well, they only realized he'd gone once they got here. Right. So at that time, they're not going to go back At that there, point, you're not going to wait. You're, not, you're never going to fight for the same piece of ground twice. Well, try arguing that with Sapper Peachy. Right. He was not a happy bunny. Um, but anyway, so he says, on a, so they, they then blow up the bridge. Um, he said, the whole centre span being demolished, giving a gap of 15 to 20 feet. The time taken was about five minutes. So five Excellent. minutes to get out, get your general wade charges on, blow it up. The net result is, despite people being dropped in the wrong drop, drop zone, despite the chaos, despite the mayhem, despite people landing in the swamp and all the rest of it, yeah. actually, the whole thing is completely successful. Right. You know, they take the Pegasus Bridge, they take Horsa Bridge, they blew up every single one of the five bridges along here that they're supposed to. So you'd have to say the British airborne operations are totally successful. They're not successful in the way that is being planned, but who cares? Right. Amazing. I'm so glad we come here, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Such a good story. I'd say, it just kind of reminds you of Kelly's heroes, doesn't it? Whilst we're unable to follow a strict chronology as we drive across Normandy, I do want to give Mike a flavour of all that happened here during the battle. My plan for today is to take him to some of the beaches where the British and Canadians landed. Then we'll be heading west to the American half of the invasion front. The French mayor of Colville says, right, you know, when the first uh, Allied troop arrives, we will double name our town after that, that person. So they see this British private. And he goes, oh, well, cheers, mate, but I couldn't possibly do that. I better go up to my, uh, my sergeant. And the sergeant goes, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. I have to go up to my platoon commander. <laughs> and the British guy goes, I can't possibly do that. I must go all the way. I must go up to my, uh, my company commander. And he goes all the way up to Montgomery. He says, thank you very much. <laughs> so it is to Colville Montgomery that we are heading, the center of Sword Beach and around 10 miles north of Normandy's largest city, Caen. Recognize that? Right. That's it. Looks almost exactly the same. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. And there they are. And see how much this has been churned up. All this battle damage. But that is just, every part of that is exactly the same, isn't it? 
It's at a slightly well, different angle. Well, the steeple is the church. That's yeah. the church, so it's completely destroyed okay, and it's Yeah, rebuilt. so it's a completely different church now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is gone. pretty much right at the angle it's, that's taken at. Wow. And there's, there's that one. The only bits have gone is these little bits yeah. here. And but again, can... look at all the damage to the tiles. Yeah, yeah. None of the British and Canadian beaches were easily won. Bitter fighting marked sword, but there were other complications too. And what you've got here is British 3rd Division. And British 3rd Division has been swollen, so it's about 23,000 strong. Although reinforced, a large part of the attacking force were commandos, whose mission was to swiftly help reinforce their airborne troops. The tide here was especially high, and the beach was becoming quickly congested. This meant supporting tanks and artillery were soon behind schedule to help clear Hillman, the vital German strongpoint, two miles inland. And so they just get bogged down, and you know, Hillman doesn't fall till after dusk. And by that time, it's too late to get to Kong. Anyway, to the Canadians. Let's go. We've now moved west to Juneau Beach. It's often forgotten how key the Canadian part was in the D-Day story. So I'm keen for Mike to see where they came ashore at around 7.45 a.m. Joining our trip as part of the crew is historian Paul Woodage, a Brit in Normandy who knows the battlefield intimately. Here at saint aubin the Germans again defended ferociously. There was at least two or three machine guns down that section of houses there. Uh, there was the heavy one about where the lamppost is, where the, the bathrooms are now, and that little fence. Another one in the building behind, and mortars two or the three room. lots of mortars around in the gardens behind, all zeroed in. And they built it all in the, the existing French seawall here. Yeah, smart. This one gun covers the beach that way. Yeah. The beach that way, that road, that road, and that road sword you can just walk off it right a uh, gold you can just kind of walk off it but yeah, here yeah. you've got a good eight foot of that wall yeah this has all of the disadvantage that we saw at sword plus more i mean it's got the narrow beach so you're bottled up here you had to get over the seawall mm -hmm. and then same choke points and then once you get through the choke points you've got this maze you have to weave your way through just to get out of here so where were the german mortar positions do you know they're sort of 75 yards back that way. They'd had, um, they'd cleared out back gardens of houses. I mean, they couldn't see the beaches, but they had everything. You don't have to, though, yeah. So what, how I would have done it is just like that. And I would have pre-fired all of that. And as soon as they tell you coming in, you have somebody coming up here with a spotter. Um, you're usually on a wire ground phone. And he's just telling you which pre-selected target positions to be firing in. And you can do it all day long. Percentage-wise, is the landing force, more Canadians die here than, than Americans in Omaha, or Brits on sword. Yep. Smallest force, so it's about 380, 390 guys die, which doesn't sound very many, but of a force of... of Two brigades, which is nothing. Yeah, 9,000 or something. You think there's, there's two and a half divisions landing at, at Omaha? Yeah, percentage-wise, that's a lot of casualties. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, the Canadians always get left out of the narrative, but their effort here is absolutely phenomenal. We're now leaving the British sector behind and heading west. While the British dropped one division of paratroopers, the Americans sent in two, the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, more than 13,000 men. They had an equally crucial role to play in securing the westward flank. The paratroopers that assembled here, where were typically were they landing? Were they mostly landing this way, oh, this way? All around. All around. Yeah. This is Lafayette where part of the 82nd Airborne landed next to the River Murderer. See that, as a paratrooper, that absolutely terrifies me, knowing that this whole area was flooded. You know, these, these guys are jumping low, so they're you know, below even 800 feet. They're between five and 800. Yeah, they're, they're supposed to be dropped at 600 feet with the Dakotas, the, the C-47s reduced to about 110 miles an hour. Okay, so you come out, you know, the, obviously the first thing you do is look up, even in the dark, you can kind of survey it, you can see your suspension lines, you know, okay, I'm under a good parachute. I don't have an in-air emergency. Then the next thing you need to do is you need to check around you because you don't know how close the guy in front and in back of you came out or from a neighboring aircraft. Right. So there could be somebody right there you're getting ready to collide with, and that's going to ruin both of your nights. So you don't want that. So now I'm trying to figure out what I'm landing in. And if the clouds have obscured the moon, all I'm seeing is darkness. And 
maybe I'm hearing that splash as my fellow paratroopers are hitting the water. So then I've got just enough time to really worry about it because I have no idea how deep it is, right? Is this the actual river that they're landing yeah, into yeah. right here? Or is it just a little bit of swampy land? Right. But 600 feet is, um, you know, and obviously people are being dropped less than that, and some people are being dropped a lot higher than that. But just say 600 feet, how, how long are you in the air for with that? Literally, in the time that I just took to explain it, that was more time than they would have had. But to me, that would have been absolutely terrifying, landing in water with all that kit that they had on. It is interesting that the number of people that are drowned in this flooded area is actually comparatively small. Yeah, we think it's about two, two, two dozen. Whereas the myth, the way the narrative is told, suggests we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, sort of, you know, are, are coming down. And... They're abandoning their equipment, though. That's the thing. Yes. It's, it's, so you're getting the cliche here, and it is a cliche, but it's a true cliche. The guy's coming out with a fighting knife between their teeth, and that's all they've got. They're not dead, but they've left behind all the heavy gear. Mm -hmm. So when they're here dealing with the, the, the attacks later on, they've got like six rounds of uh, right, bazooka so, ammunition between so them, because all the rest weapon. is all down there. Right. While the 82nd Airborne were holding the high ground to the west of the key town of San Mariglis, the 101st were given the task of protecting the US landing at Utah Beach. So I've been to Breakwell Manor loads and loads and loads of times, but I have never, ever walked in the field. Really? No. To me, Dick Winters is the quintessential army leader in every sense of the word. Cared about his men. He was hard when he needed to be kept himself to a high standard, expected the same of his men, led from the front. Yeah, yeah, led, absolutely. Led from the front. Yeah, again, and not just here, but also in Carantan as well, yeah. which we'll be going to. Is Extremely important. We're heading to Breakall Manor, immortalized in the TV series, Band of Brothers. That was a damage up there on the window. Yeah, yeah, but that looks above the archway well. and here yeah. as well. And be aware, the electric fences will all be on, so... OK. OK. You're in my world now, James. I, I know this. Yeah. I want to be led. Just a handful of men from Easy Company, the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, were ordered to capture and destroy four guns that threatened Utah. So my turn to name drop. I've been here across here with Don Malarkey. Have you? Twice or three times. Compton twice and Garnier twice. As we're about to discover, though, the reality was quite different from the TV drama. The sequence in the show is 12 minutes of bam, 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 bam. Yeah, yeah. But of course, like it that. wasn't like that. You're talking like an hour and a half of intermittent fighting to get this point. Lieutenant Dick Winters, the commanding officer, had to decide his plan swiftly. The main route of attack was using an ancient culvert that ran towards the German guns. Of course, it's full summer. There's a big green canopy over here, and you can crawl up that way then. So that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because you've got your you've got your advance completely covered. Yeah. No one's going to see a thing. These few men successfully destroyed all four guns and demonstrated that, in terms of training, the Allied airborne troops were among the very best. You know, it just underlines the point, doesn't it, why it is so important to, to walk the ground. When you walk the ground, things become clearer in a way they never can in a kind of 2D map or yeah, just a description absolutely. from a book. Yeah. Our final stop for the day may not be the one you would expect. Although we're heading east towards Omaha Beach, arguably the most famous location in the D-Day story, it will have to wait. There's a location to the west of the beach that Mike has been longing to visit since a child, when he first set his sights on becoming a US Army Ranger, Point de Hoc. To me, this is hollowed ground. I mean, ever since my military infancy, these were the first stories that I ever heard. This is what senior NCOs pointed to and said, this is what your predecessors did at Point de Hoc. This is what we can expect from you when the time comes. And so these are all craters from the bombing, Mike. Yeah. And, and this place was absolutely pounded repeatedly. I mean, when the rangers got to the top, they just said, you know, we were just looking at a moonscape. Mm -hmm. 
they actually get up with absolutely no problem whatsoever. I mean, there's hardly any casualties at all. There's hardly any firing whatsoever. And when they get up here, they find there's absolutely no Germans and no guns. So actually scaling up the cliffs is like the biggest doddle of all. What is amazing about this site here and the battle here is the counterattacks that follow later on D-Day and on the 7th of June. And they're not finally relieved until the 8th, I think. It's 8th, 10.30 uh, in the morning. 10.30 in the morning on the 8th. So they hold out here with diminishing um, amounts of ammunition. And it's a fantastically heroic stand. But that's what's brilliant about this. That's where the rangers earn their spurs, not skating up the cliffs. To me, that's even more inspiring. They came up these cliffs with only what they could carry on their backs and pull up behind them. Right? They're not heavily armed, they're not, certainly not mechanized, they don't have a lot of fire support with them. So it's literally their GI shirts and their individual weapons, and they're holding this ground against a counterattack. And what's behind them are those same sheer cliffs that they climbed up. So they have to hold this ground. I mean, there's no two ways about it. They have to do so. That's the movie that I want to see. I, I can think of two moving moments in my lifetime when I went to a place and it literally struck me with emotion down to my core. The, the other time was at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and this time is here. It's uh, it, because it's, it's something that has become larger than life, larger than existence in my mind, because this, this is hollowed ground, as I said. This is, this is iconic in Ranger history, and no matter what I do, No matter what I do in the rest of my life, I'm always going to be a ranger. So. <laughs>